Hey, it's Charles. A few months ago, the New York Federal Reserve came out with a report with some bleak news. At the end of 2022, Americans racked up credit card debt at the fastest pace the researchers behind the report had ever seen. The amount? $986 billion. In other words, we're close to a trillion dollars in total credit card debt. The increase could be a telltale sign of how many people are turning to cards to keep up with rising costs. And a lot of people might be looking for help on how to figure this stuff out, like how to best pay off credit card debt. This week, we're revisiting an episode from last year where we walk through some recent research on the popular personal financial advice that people often come across. And we talk to an expert about if that advice actually holds up. Here's the episode. Hope you enjoy. The economists will assume that you can just flip the switch on age 35 and suddenly you become a super saver. And the popular authors say, look, human psychology doesn't work that way. And so it's better to be consistent in your savings over time. Welcome to The Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast for MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. Today, we're going to start in the studio of, well, actually, another radio show. Katie's with us in Dallas, Texas. Hi, Katie. How are you? Yes, I'm good. How are you? Great. How can we help? That's a clip from The Ramsey Show. You might know it. It's a very popular personal finance show and podcast with millions of listeners. In this clip, the listener Katie confesses to having racked up tens of thousands of dollars in credit card debt. What did you spend uh, the credit card money on? Um, just transitioning over from one job to another, paying my way. Oh, crap. Got into debt. You did not spend $27,000 transitioning from one job to another. Now, Dave Ramsey and his co-host give Katie the same advice they've given before, which he's pretty famous for. It's called the debt snowball, and it means you pay off the smallest credit card debt first. The idea is that that will motivate you to keep going. You're going to list out the debts from smallest to largest, so the smallest credit card debt to the largest one. We're not looking at the interest rate. We're not going to do math right now. We're going to work on progress. The Ramsey Show is just one example of how millions of people look for financial advice. The show says it has more than 18 million weekly listeners. And long before podcasts, many turned to books on personal finance for advice. The book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki has reportedly sold 32 million copies since 1997. Another, The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas J. Stanley and William Danko has sold more than 3 million copies. But what kind of advice are these popular authors giving? That's something today's guest has actually looked into. The genesis of this all was when I started teaching a personal finance class at Yale a few years ago. And I was looking for some textbooks, and it seemed natural for me to look not just at academic textbooks, but kind of the hundreds of popular personal finance books that are out there in the marketplace. That's James Choi, a professor of finance at the Yale School of Management. So I picked out a few, and I was reading them, and it occurred to me that, wow, these authors are writing things that some of which I just disagree with on kind of an opinionated level and some of which I thought was just factually wrong. Choi wanted to understand better how the popular advice differed from the corresponding advice from benchmark academic theories. That quest turned into a study called Popular Personal Finance Advice Versus the Professors. It was published by the National Bureau of Economic Research in August. In the study, Choi looks at some of the most popular advice given in the top 50 personal finance books. We'll get into a few of those topics, saving, asset allocation, and the best ways to pay down debt in a moment. But first, Choi argues that the popular authors are in fact more influential than the economists. Well, the most popular of these authors, they have millions and millions of viewers or listeners or readers. And if I can get 500 people to read one of my papers, I think that's a pretty good reach that I've had. And so often, academic researchers are talking to a fairly narrow audience. And, you know, if we're lucky, then the audience includes some policymakers who will implement some sort of legislation or policies or whatever. 
but kind of speaking to the ordinary person, that's not really what we do most of the time. It's not what we're even in the business of doing, really. And these popular authors, they're in the business of trying to get themselves in front of eyeballs and, and, and listened to. A recent study published by the University of Bonn illustrates how popular authors might be influencing people's money decisions. It found that exposure to Dave Ramsey's radio show reduced household retail spending by 5.4%. And so it's no surprise that I think that these people are more influential just because they're getting a lot more exposure uh, than academic economists are. Now, some of them are influenced to a certain extent by the ideas that have come from the academy. And so in that sense, they are an amplification mechanism for some of the ideas that we have. So you read 50 books on personal finance for this project. I mean, I've covered personal finance. I don't know if I've read 50 books in my lifetime. I mean, what was it like going through all these books? Well, I'll confess that I did not read every single word of every page from all 50 books. I had specified ahead of time which topics I wanted to cover in my survey. It was interesting because there are certain themes that kind of come through and, and you see certain phrases even get repeated over and over again across these different books as you kind of really see this stream of thought that runs through the mainstream of American personal financial thought. Kind of this notion of setting life goals, having positive thoughts, understanding what's really important to you. So none of that stuff actually made it into my paper because that wasn't really in the scope but it does give an insight into the American psyche and what people are looking for when they're coming to these books. It's not just about managing the money per se, but there is a sense in which they are looking for a better life and a peace of mind. The first topic Choi looked into is how much to save and how to do it. The popular authors are very big on consistency and savings rates. So over time, you should be saving a similar amount as a percent of your income through thick and thin. So I, you might call that smoothing savings rates. Academic economists would say that the way to go is to actually smooth your consumption, to have a consistent level of expenditure on yourself over time, more or less. In other words, economists don't advise you to save the same throughout your life. They say, when you're young and not earning as much money, you can save less, maybe nothing at all, but then when you're older and earn more money, you should really gear up on that savings rate. It's just a more pleasant life to consume the same or a similar moderate amount in you know, this year and the next year versus really scrimping and scrounging and struggling this year, but then overindulging next year. Now, for most people, their income in their 40s and 50s is predictably higher than it is in their 20s. So if you were to save a consistent percent of your income in your 20s as you did in your 40s and 50s, you would be really living at a fairly low standard of living in your 20s, and you would enjoy a considerably higher standard of living in your 40s and 50s. And economists would say, look, Maybe you can smooth out that consumption over your life cycle and live a bit more comfortably in your 20s and more modestly than you could otherwise afford in your 40s and 50s. And what that would imply is that your savings rate would be relatively low in your 20s and you would be a super saver in your 40s and 50s when at that point your income would be much higher and you could more easily save a large amount. Living comfortably through your entire life sounds pretty appealing. So why do the popular authors advise you to save a lot when you're young and don't have a lot of money? One reason is the power of compounding interest. Compound interest is like super interest. That's because you're not only earning interest on the principal or the initial amount, but also on the interest that's accumulating. Another reason besides that one, well, it's kind of psychological. I think there is this notion that you build a certain discipline of saving, that you become a type of person who is frugal by consistently saving over time. And that's not something that's really present in academic, economic models. So the economists will assume that you can just flip the switch on at age 35 and suddenly you become a super saver, even though you have hardly been saving at all up until that point in life. 
And the popular authors say, look, human psychology doesn't work that way. If you have been saving before, then you're gonna have a really hard time saving a ton right now. And so it's better to be consistent in your savings over time. Choi also looked at asset allocation, questions like how much money to put in stocks versus bonds, or whether to invest in international stocks or not. In this case, the two camps are pretty aligned. I think that the popular authors and the academic authors, for the most part, end up in not dissimilar places, but for different reasons. But at the end of the day, what are both camps saying? They say that you should, when you're very young, so you're in your 20s, you know, you might want to be a little bit more conservative than you would be in your 30s simply because you have such a thin buffer of assets. So if something goes wrong and you need to draw down on your assets, maybe you don't want to have as much risk in your portfolio as you would in your 30s or 40s. What Choi is saying is that when you're in your 20s, you might want to be a little more conservative because it's likely that you have less money to work with when you're that young and then have a very equity forward strategy through midlife and then become more conservative in your asset allocation as you approach retirement. So that's, there's an area of of a lot of agreement between those two camps in terms of the life cycle of asset allocation. I think there's also a lot of agreement when it comes to actively managed versus passively managed funds. Both camps will say that index funds are really the way to go. And I think there's a lot of data that shows that that's a pretty good strategy. There are things on the margins where I think that the two camps have differences. So for example, on the value of getting dividends from your stocks, particularly as you are approaching or are in retirement, the popular authors are much more favorable towards dividends, whereas the academic uh, authors would say, you know, you don't need to wait for that dividend check to come to finance your expenditure from your investments, you can just sell some of the stock that you have and actually pay a lower capital gains tax probably than what you are going to be burdened by if you got a dividend check and then had to pay taxes on those dividends. But again, I think that that's probably a little bit more on the margins of things that impact the welfare of the individual investor. And so I think on the broad margins, you do end up in somewhat similar places when you follow either camp's advice. Recently, we've seen a new wave of investment advice circulating on social media platforms like Reddit. What's Choi's perspective on the rise of the retail investor in an age of cheap and accessible trading? There's a very famous study, a very, very famous couple of studies from the 1990s that found that when individuals trade stocks, they lose tons of money. So this study by Terry O'Dean, Brad Barber, uh, cited all the time in the popular press. What is not as commonly known is that transaction costs were much higher in the early 90s, which is when that sample period uh, in, in the studies was taken from. And transactions costs have come down a lot since the early 1990s. And so it's actually not nearly as costly to be trading in and out of individual stocks as it used to be. So I tell my students, even though you might have been taught that this stuff is really bad for you, it's not as bad as it's been hyped up to be. Now, do I think that people should be trading in these individual stocks? No, I don't, because I don't think that they have any information advantage. I do think that it causes them to be under diversified. But in terms of, you know, on average, do they lose a ton of money on these individual stock trades? I don't think that they actually do lose a ton of money because it is so cheap nowadays to trade in these individual stocks. I think that where people do get really hurt, and there's emerging evidence on this, is when they trade options through these platforms, where there the transactions costs are very high and there are not obvious ways in which you can get exploited in the options market because these are markets that are much more complicated to understand. So I think that's where the real action is in terms of consumer harm or or retail investor harm in the options market rather than in the trading on individual stocks. Coming up, how do the professors differ from the popular authors on strategies around how to pay off debt? 
That's after the break. Welcome back to the best new ideas in money. Before the break, we talked to Professor of Finance James Choi about a new study where he looks at the advice given by the popular authors of personal finance books and how it stacks up against the advice from economists. So what about this question of how to best pay off debt? As we heard in the beginning of the episode, the popular Ramsey Show advises people to pay off their smallest credit card debts first, and not the cards with the highest interest rate. What we started calling the debt snowball. And um, it's a real, you know, real tough metaphor to grasp. You list your debts, smallest to largest, you pay minimum payments on everything but the little one. You attack the little one with a vengeance. Here's James Choi. This is another area where I think the divergence between the popular advice and the academic advice comes down to a little bit of a a theory about human nature and human motivation. The academics would say that this is a very simple math problem. When you are thinking about paying down debt, you should prioritize paying down the highest interest rate debt because that's the most expensive that you have, and that's the way that you're going to get the most dollars at the end of the day to spend on yourself. A lot of the popular authors say, yeah, that might be correct mathematically, but there is something that you're forgetting, which is the motivation angle. If you don't get some quick wins early on, you're just going to give up and not complete your debt pay down plan. And so what you should do instead of prioritizing paying down the highest interest rate debt that you have is to pay down the lowest balance debt that you have. And by zeroing out a debt account, you're going to feel good about your progress and that's going to power you through to the end of your debt payment plan. I actually have not seen evidence that the debt snowball is in fact more motivating and more successful at the end of the day than the other uh, strategy which the popular authors call the debt avalanche strategy, where you prioritize the highest interest rate debt. I would love to see better evidence on this. At the end of the day, I do think that the best diet is the one that you can stick to. And so if indeed the debt snowball helps you stay motivated to pay down debt, then yeah, you should go for it. It's just that I'm not convinced at the moment that it is, in fact, more motivating for people. What was the worst piece of advice you found among the popular authors, and why was it so objectionable? Well, there are some authors that recommend get-rich-quick sorts of strategies where you will buy real estate using a ton of debt, and you flip it for a big profit later on, and that works great when real estate prices are rising. But of course, real estate prices can fall too, and that can leave you in bankruptcy. So I think that that's the most irresponsible advice that I saw. I think where the popular authors may actually end up being right is more on the savings margin, where you start getting into these questions of, is it the right thing to do to establish the discipline early on in life of saving, even though that means that you're really scrimping and scrounging in your 20s, it just makes you into the type of person who is frugal and lives within their means, and that keeps you out of trouble in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, versus trusting yourself that you're going to be able to flip on that super saver switch in your mid-30s and rocket your way into a secure retirement. That's something that I don't think that anybody really knows, and so uh, it very well may be that going with the popular authors on the savings end and then on the debt repayment end to get those quick wins, to do the debt snowball, maybe that's the diet that works for you. And at the end of the day, you know, kind of going along with this diet analogy, is the Atkins diet or the Mediterranean diet or, or what have you, there are a lot of diets out there that are pretty reasonable. None of them may be the ideal diet, but the best diet is the one that's pretty reasonable that you can stick with. I've got to say, you sound like my cardiologist now. He's like, just lose some weight. I don't care whatever method you use. But I think one of the things you're you're kind of saying here, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that sometimes these popular authors will espouse ideas that that sound right and that may work for people. 
but some of this hasn't been battle tested. Yeah, I, I think that there is a real lack of evidence here, and I think that I blame the academic economists here. We should have been researching this stuff. Like, this is pretty important material. What is the best way to get people to pay down their debt? What is the best way to keep people motivated to stick to a reasonable savings plan? We just haven't been researching it, and that's why there is no evidence. And we've kind of abandoned the field to these popular authors where they have their lay theories, their intuitions for what the right thing to do is. I would love to see more research to see, does any of this stuff actually work? Because on our end, we have just been mostly preoccupied with thinking about what is the right thing to do if you have perfect self-control and you don't get discouraged and you can stick to your plan. And I don't think that most of us think that human beings are like that. Thanks for listening to The Best New Ideas in Money. You can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a rating or review. And if you have ideas for future episodes, drop us a line at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to James Choi. To learn more about personal finance strategies, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast from MarketWatch. Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer, and the producers are Katie Ferguson, Michael McDowell, and Meta Lutzhoff. Jeremy Binks is our news editor, and Tim Rostin is the executive editor for MarketWatch. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University, and not part of the MarketWatch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.